All right. So last week we finished up discussing living apologetics. We finished up our look at the chapter and looked at the questions as well. And now we're moving into chapter 20, page 175 in our book. Can we trust the Bible? Really, chapter 20 and chapter 21 really should, they, they, they're part one and part two. They really are basically all one big chapter. So we're going to treat it as such. Uh, because really, cha uh, chapter 20 goes right into chapter 21. It doesn't miss a beat at all. So we're going to treat it that way. It's just one big chapter. I uh, do want to mention the quote on page 174 from Craig Bloomberg, uh, or Blomberg. Uh, Doy quotes him, who borrows from whom, that the closest parallels to the New Testament miracles all post-date the life of Jesus suggests that if anyone borrowed from anyone else, it was not Christianity from paganism, but rather the Greco-Roman religions from Christianity. The more the Jesus movement grew and spread, the more others would have tried to compete by modeling their holy figures to some degree on the stories of Jesus with which they became familiar. These chapter 20 and chapter 21 is going to address the specifically the historicity, uh, the, the being able to rely on the history of the Gospels, in particular the Gospels, uh, is kind of one of the main uh, main objects of the of the essay or chapter uh, that we're talking about. So moving into chapter twenty, can we trust the Bible? Doy starts out describing the fact that obviously there's a lot of there's a lot of skeptics that that we face. There's a lot of people. A lot of people simply just repeat what they've heard other people say regarding the Bible, the fact that it was written by men, you can't really rely on anything that it says. Uh, one point that he makes, the second paragraph here, as a preliminary point, we should recognize that the skeptical, skeptical arguments are generally based upon assumptions about what can or cannot be true in history. So keep in mind, Doi's already dealt with these presuppositions, and one of the concepts of presuppositions that some people have is being skeptical that miracles can exist, that miracles could have happened. And the fact that outside of our modern experience, therefore it couldn't have happened, is the worldview that some people have. Uh, and so because the Gospels record miracles, and for that matter the book of Acts as well, they can't possibly be true from a history perspective. They can't be recording actual events because miracles couldn't have possibly have happened. Uh, and so that's what Dewey is describing here, is the fact that when you deal with skeptics and you deal with individuals who are going to, to speak against the, the accuracy of the Bible, you're also going to have to deal with those presuppositions. He says... Uh, these are not demonstrated facts. If our worldview did not permit miracles or resurrection, then we would be required to argue that the gospel accounts are not accurate his historically. Our worldview would give us no other option but to come up with another explanation that cannot include anything supernatural. We should not be surprised then to encounter these skeptical arguments. Uh, and of course, a lot of that has to do with the presuppositions that uh, he dealt with earlier. Uh, this... Third paragraph, he says, of course, challenging skeptical assumptions does not automatically prove that the Bible gives us an accurate portrayal of the real Jesus. How then can we argue for the reliability of gospel records? And so he's going to describe, there's two main sections of at least chapter 20 that he's going to describe. The first one is dealing with the oral culture of the first century. And then the second one is what historians want to know. And there are 10 questions that historians basically ask when they're observing historical documents or they're trying to determine if a, uh, an ancient document or ancient manuscript is trustworthy. Uh, and that's why he goes through, I think, four or five of them. And then into chapter 21, he picks up with question five or question six and moves on uh, and covers the rest in chapter 21. So he deals with the oral history of the first century, the oral culture. Uh, and that's what this first section describes. And the fact is that there was an oral culture. But notice what Doi says. 
We need to be aware that before anything was written down, the stories were being told orally. This has caused some to assume that if they were oral, they could not have been accurate. And that gets repeated a lot. The fact that, well, this is stuff that's just been, it's been passed down from generation to generation. And then when it was finally written down, there's no guarantee that what they had was accurate to what it started out as. But keep in mind that from the events that we're, just, that we're talking about, okay, 38, 33 AD-ish, okay, 35 AD, and, you know, the, the, in terms of, of the events of the Gospels, the actual writing of the Gospels in the 50s and 60s and John in the 90s, the earliest manuscript that we have in terms of, of fragments and, and documents and so forth dates to around 100, 120, 130. And so the argument is, well, obviously from the 50s, when the earliest gospel was written, until 120 or 130, there was no written, uh, written record that we can go to to say, see, this is what this is. But keep in mind, the early, the early first century church, as Paul was writing these letters of, of 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans, as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were writing their Gospels, they were getting passed through the churches. Just because we don't have existing manuscripts that are original in terms of, in other words, they were actually written or penned by the individual, does not mean that they're not accurate. But Doi talks about this concept of oral, uh, oral history. He says, uh, this is called, uh, however, oral studies or orality studies have shown that oral cultures were, in fact, able to maintain sufficient consistency in their storytelling. Those who spoke the messages and told the stories publicly were concerned about not straying from the true storyline. They had freedom to use their own vocabulary and personality but not to change the core facts. And so he brings up the Gospels reflect this kind of culture, which is one reason we see both similarities and differences in the way the writers conveyed the information. It was perfectly in line with their culture and styles and does not conflict with the biblical doctrine of inspiration. Further, many have realized there are fundamental differences between ancient oral cultures and the modern post-Gutenberg print culture. And he describes the fact that what we would expect or how we would write something is not necessarily how the gospel writers uh, wrote things. And we have to recognize the culture in which they lived, how they worded things, how they wrote things is different than how we would do it. Especially given the fact that, I mean, the original was written in Greek, New Testament anyway, and we've got it in English. So there, there's going to be, even, even more so, there's going to be things we have to recognize in terms of their culture. Uh, the last point that Doi makes with regard to the oral culture of the first century, uh, failure to see the differences can result in anachronistic fallacies by making modern demands of the written text that the ancient writers never would have considered. If we're going to be fair to the writers, we need to study them within their own cultural context, not ours. That's a good point to make. Thoughts or comments through that, that first section? One of the things that Luke records here in Luke chapter 1 and in verse 1, Luke says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things. What does he say? Is Luke the first to record? He says, many have taken in hand. Luke wasn't the first and he certainly wasn't the last. But many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. Now keep in mind, Luke comes on the scene a little bit later uh, in terms of, of Jesus and, and the, the, his three-year ministry and so forth. But as he describes and records the things that the apostles described, what they encountered, what they saw. And Luke even includes the things that he himself saw when you move into Acts and the things that he himself experienced. But he says that many have taken in hand to set in order. You know, it's, it's entirely 
possible, if not probable, that all of the apostles wrote letters <laughs> to different churches. And, I mean, we don't have a lot of those today, obviously. What we have is contained in the Bible. But it's very probable that the, all the apostles were involved in correspondence with brethren. And so just because, and this is the argument that, this is, you know, kind of dealing with the argument that people make, just because we may not have the original document pinned by Paul or pinned by Peter or pinned by Bartholomew, doesn't mean it's not accurate to what they did pin. I think that's a very important point to make. Oh, man. Well, and what does Peter tell us? We've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay? Everything that we need to know, we're given. You know, are there a lot of things that we, that we would love to know? You know, in terms of, like, what was the very first letter of the, that, that Corinth, what was the letter that Corinth wrote to Paul? Because in 1 Corinthians, Paul is responding to questions from Corinth. I, I would be curious to know what exactly it was that they wrote Paul about, but you can kind of infer what those questions are based on his responses to them. But, but still, there's a lot, I'm sure, that, that correspondence maybe between Paul and Timothy or Paul and Titus or Paul and Silas that we don't have. I'd love to have it. But do we need it? No. Everything we need to know in terms of how to worship God, how the church is to be established, how the church is to function, uh, the, the hierarchy of authority of elders, uh, all of that, we've been, give, been given all of that. And there's nothing else we need to know in terms of the salvation of our souls and living a righteous life. Everything else has been given to us. Anything else on that? Yeah, Philip. Keep in mind, uh, a lot of the people who have trouble with the fact that they don't have original, they also study things like Beowulf. And if you know the history of that, there is one copy mm -hmm. that they found after a library burn, and it's only partial. People study it and hold it up as this literary amazing thing. Yeah. And there's one of them. Yeah. <laughs> and, so and they take that as accurate. Right. Keep that in mind when you're Absolutely. In fact, in chapter 23, Dewey is going to talk about all the different specific manuscripts and, and the, the main manuscripts upon which the New King, or the King James and the American Standard are based and so forth. Uh, we dealt with a lot of that. Uh, it's been a couple of years ago uh, in our church history class. But the, the concepts of, of what Philip just described even Doy, descri he, he describes the fact that there are many manuscripts that historians take as being, this is true to the original. Okay, now some of those are fictional, like Beowulf, but these are true to the original, and this is exactly what was written, and they accept that at face value. In fact, the general thought, the general way in which historians approach a historical document, for that matter, any ancient manuscript, is until we're given reason to believe it's not accurate, we take it at face value. We assume it is accurate until you come to the Bible. Because the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, teaches about miracles. And since that doesn't fit into the worldview of many historians and many scholars, it can't be accurate. Not that it's been proven inaccurate. It's that they can't accept it as being accurate. There's a big difference. All right. Anything else through that part? And, and of course, what did Paul describe? Uh, and as Paul was uh, describing to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I mean, the early church, did they have a New Testament that they could open and flip through and read? What did the early church have to do? Yeah, they, they, they knew in part, they prophesied in part. You know, that was part of the reason for the miraculous gifts in terms of its effect on the early church. And its, its benefit for the early church was that since there wasn't anything written down and, and put together yet, they didn't have something they could go to themselves and read the word of God. 
in terms of the New Testament. They had to get it from an individual who had either been taught it by someone else, by an apostle, for instance. The church in Rome is a pretty good example of that. Apparently, the church in Rome, first of all, doesn't appear it was founded by an apostle. And none of the brethren apparently had any miraculous gifts because Paul says in Romans chapter 1, I want to come to you so that I may impart miraculous gifts to you. Which means, apparently, the brethren there were simply, they had set everything up based on what they'd been taught. Which means they were taught accurately, at least. But they didn't have anyone to whom they could go to to confirm something or anything like that. And that's what the purpose of the, the first century miracles, the miraculous works, that's what they were for. To confirm the word. Uh, but once that which is perfect has come, Paul said... That which is in part will be done away with. Once there's written record, and of course, the, the, early, the early gospel, or, I mean, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they were first written, uh, well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John was written in the 90s, and then uh, the, the letters to the Cor uh, Corinthians, Paul at certain points even references letters he wrote, now send this letter on to uh, Philippi and have them read it and, and so forth. There, there were instructions contained within that to once you've read it, and you know what it says, and you are, are either are able to remember it, or e maybe they've recorded it down, they've copied it, or whatever. You pass it on to this congregation or that congregation so that they know. Think about the letter to the Galatians. Was that written to a single congregation? The region of Galatia. Paul even addresses that in Galatians chapter 1. It wasn't just to one church. It was to a whole bunch of churches in Galatia. So what did they do? They had to pass it around. Okay, one church would get it, then a messenger would take it to the next church, and so on and so forth. But Revelation. Okay, Jesus, and of course we've noticed before kind of the, the path. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, these statements that Jesus makes to the seven churches of Asia. All right, the messenger who took them from John, after John wrote them down from the revelation of Jesus... He would go to each church, and it would be read in each church, and maybe read multiple times. And that's how that worked. I, I thought I saw a hand. Uh, Nick, was it your hand? No? Okay. All right, anything else? All right, this second section, what historians want to know. A basic principle to keep in mind when considering the reliability of the biblical records is that when subjected to the same tests that are used of other ancient documents, the Bible passes every test. When historians look at ancient documents, there are certain matters they want to know about the texts. Following, we want to give a brief sampling of what types of questions are asked about ancient documents and see how the Bible fares. Uh, and he always is very clear to say, listen, there's a whole lot more that could be said about this. In fact, there's, I think it's Appendix 1 or 2, where he goes a little bit even more in-depth uh, into some of these discussions. But he starts out, the very first thing he says is, do we possess copies that are reasonably close to the originals? Okay, that's the very first question that is asked. How much time has passed from the original document, presumably, to the very first existing document that we have. So how, mu how much time in between there? The biblical documents fare better in this area than other ancient documents. We have copies that are closer to the originals than other ancient works by comparison. Thousands of fragments and copies exist for the New Testament, dating roughly between 50 years and 1,500 years from when they were written. Just 50 years after they were written, we've got copies. Complete copies begin to appear within about 300 years. And that's not long by ancient standards. And Dolly quotes, what manuscripts can do is provide evidence of a reliable text. A reliable text attested by thousands of manuscripts is just that, a reliable text. Now what that means is, is that scholars can take all of these thousands of copies, compare them to one another, and see if there was any change from the 50-year fragments all the way through the a thousand years after fragments. And this is one of the points that Dewey makes is that, in fact, one of the, one of the scholars themselves mentioned 
that you could just as easily take the earliest fragments, substitute them in your current Bible, obviously translated into English, and you would be able to read it just fine the way as it is. Because there's not, there's not that big a difference. In terms of, of spellings of certain things, there's you know, some, some minute, small differences. But in terms of the meaning of the passages, it's all there. And from all of the fragments, all of the different copies, there's not much that changes. And that's one of the great things about, the, obviously, the providence of God in protecting his word and keeping it what it needs to be. This does not in itself prove that the content of the text is accurate, but it does give us a good textual foundation. As Peterson further notes, providing arguments for the trustworthiness of a text's actual claims is not something with which textual criticism can help. Those types of important arguments must come from other fields of inquiry. The answer to this question is yes, and this provides a solid starting point. So the question of do we possess copies that are reasonably close to the originals? Yeah. As early as 50 years after the originals were in existence. These would have been probably, this, these probably would have been first generation or second generation copies. Okay, so the original copy, for instance, of Paul's letter to the, to the Galatians. There may have been, the, 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 for instance, the fragments that we have. That may have been a first generation. That's the very first copy of the original. Or it may have been the second, the copy of the copy. That's it. And obviously, just, just from those, just from one generation to the next, there's not, if, just from, from 2,000 years worth of copies, there's not any difference. So one generation to the next generation, there's not going to be any difference. Any thoughts through that one? And Doi's going to go a little bit further into detail about these manuscripts and exactly how many copies we have and so forth. Second question. Did the authors intend to convey reliable history to the readers? Um, obviously, Philip mentioned Beowulf. Okay? Uh, there's other documents, the Odyssey. Okay? Things, things of that nature that you read these and you realize they're designed to be fiction. They're not intended to convey accurate history. But other writings, for instance, Josephus, okay, other writings are intended to convey history. Josephus is, is widely considered, at least from a Jewish perspective, uh, in terms of his accuracy of histor history from especially the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, that, and nobody questions that. Josephus absolutely recorded the historical events. But keep in mind, and what's weird is, is scholars don't really question that. They absolutely accept Josephus for what it is. But did the Jews also believe in miracles? Or at the very least, did the Pharisees believe in miracles? Yeah, they did. They believed there was going to be a resurrection. Okay, the Old Testament records miracles and works of God being done. So even though Josephus is recording his historical aspects, Josephus certainly would have believed in miracles. He would have believed in Jehovah. And, and so in terms of, of these historians, I'm not sure how they would respond to, well, yeah, Josephus may have believed in miracles and so forth, but he wasn't recording miracles. He was recording history. The Gospels, however, you've got to throw the Gospels out because they record miracles, so none of it's true. Or it's intended to be symbolic or figurative somehow. Well, when you read what Luke says, what does Luke say? Many have taken in hand to set in order a what? A narrative. What is a narrative? It's a speaking of events. Okay, speaking or declaring of events. A narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. Is there any doubt that at least Luke thinks he's recording history? Is, is Luke in any way portraying himself as recording fiction? No. No. And the same is true with Matthew, Mark, and John. And for that matter, the rest of, of the, the letters and the books of the New Testament. Uh, 
in fact, that's what Doi quotes. He quotes from Luke chapter 1. And of course, he goes on to verse 4, verse 2. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, they delivered them to us. Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly what? Story, an orderly fiction, an orderly creation, uh, just kind of cup stuff I came up with. It says account, verse 4, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. One cannot seriously read Luke and think that he meant to convey anything other than true historical information. Notice how he spoke of things accomplished, handed down from eyewitnesses, the ability to know the exact truth about these matters. Luke's intent is clear. Some believe that the writers intentionally fabricated their material or that they intended to write fiction, primarily on the grounds that the writers include miraculous accounts. Which goes back to what we talked about, that presupposition, miracles couldn't possibly have happened, therefore, instead of taking something at face value, therefore, they must be recording, deliberately recording fiction, or they're just making stuff up. The assumption simply does not comport with the facts or with what the writers actually claimed. The bottom line is this, if the Gospels did not have miracle stories, no one would be questioning whether or not they intended to convey real history. And I think that's a great point. If it weren't for the miracles, the resurrection of Jesus, nobody would argue with it. But because it does record the stuff about miracles and so forth, then it can't be real history. If our worldview permits the miraculous, we have no reason to question the historical intent of the Gospels. If our worldview does not permit the miraculous, no claims otherwise would convince us. One of the points that Doi makes at the very beginning of this chapter, that first paragraph, he kind of alludes to all of these specials on the History Channel and on the Discovery Channel about who was the real Jesus of Nazareth. Who was the real uh, man behind Jesus, the Christ of the New Testament. And the way, the light in which they, they kind of put it is, yeah, the Bible tells you this, but who was the real person? Because he couldn't possibly have been the man described in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why? Why couldn't he possibly have been that person? Well, if your worldview doesn't allow for, first of all, miracles or your worldview doesn't want to imagine or believe that there is a God who's going to judge everyone one day, then what are you going to try to do? Yeah, you're going to, you're going to just try to, to ignore that, make up something. Make up some other, at least in your mind, plausible way of dealing with what the Bible says. And so the way to do that is to say that the Gospels don't record, they record what these men want you to believe about Jesus, not the real Jesus of Nazareth. And history admits that a real man named Jesus did exist at that time, that something really did happen in that period of time, but it, it couldn't have been what the Gospels describe it as being. Anything else through that? Question three. Uh, this is page 179. Were the authors in a position to know what they were talking about? I think this is important to note because we have books and letters written by apostles, people who were there, who were eyewitnesses. And we have some books and letters written by individuals who are telling us about things that happened afterwards. For instance, Luke is an example of this. As opposed to, for instance, John. In John chapter 1, John says, starting in verse, uh, I'm sorry, 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And who is the word of life? Jesus. Verse 2, the life was manifested. In other words, it, 
it was, it was seen on earth. That's Jesus. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things, these things we write that your joy may be full. Now, John, he writes these things, especially when he says, we've seen, we've heard. Uh, all of this goes to the human aspect of Jesus. Remember in the 90s AD, there was a false teaching that was going around that Jesus really wasn't in the flesh. Jesus was an apparition. He looked like a man, but he wasn't really a man because the flesh is inherently sinful. That was the teaching that was going on. That just being in the flesh is inherently sinful. Therefore, Jesus couldn't have been in the flesh because Jesus never sinned. So he couldn't have been human. Well, John's dealing with that. And John's making the case, no, he really was human. John records for us at the end of his gospel, was it chapter 21, uh, that Jesus, after he was even raised from the dead, he sat on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias and ate fish with some of the apostles. That was after he was raised. So there, there's very clear object for John to show, I was there. Okay, My hands touched Jesus. I saw him. Now, Peter even references the Mount of Transfiguration in 1 Peter. The fact that he was there and he saw this happen. Okay, These eyewitness accounts... And then for Luke, and of course, Luke says, I knew all these things perfectly from the beginning. Well, how did he know all these things perfectly from the beginning? At the very least? Holy yeah, Holy Spirit. Okay. It's, it's very likely that Luke received a gift of the Holy Spirit from Paul. And at the very least, it would be knowledge. Okay, that's one of the reasons how Luke could have had a perfect understanding of everything, even going back to, well, I mean, Luke describes even the uh, pregnancy of Elizabeth with John the Baptist, the pregnancy of Jesus, uh, of Mary with Jesus. And Luke actually records some, some details that aren't recorded elsewhere. How did Luke know these things? The Holy Spirit told him. Okay, so all of this, even though Luke had, had full knowledge of this, he still, he expresses, here's what happened, but then he changes in, the, in midway through the book of Acts, and he starts talking about, we did this, and we went here, here, because Luke specifies, this is when I arrived on the scene, at least in the, in the, uh, in the travels uh, of Paul and so forth in the book of Acts. All right, uh, anything else through what we just talked about? Yeah. That it was manifest that there was nothing left out. Yeah, that's true. Of, of the story. And like Luke says, he had perfect knowledge. Many of us can't say we have perfect knowledge. <laughs> Even the stuff we read, right? Yeah. But he said he had perfect knowledge and understanding. You know, that's, that's even even a higher level than understanding. Yeah. Much less to have the knowledge, but to have the understanding, the big picture. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Well, in, you know, to that end, we've got two, go two of the Gospels written by apostles, Matthew and John. And then we've got two Gospels written by individuals who were, I guess you could say, second generation in John, Mark, and Luke. Okay, and so it's interesting that you've got that both, uh, both sides of that there, and they're all recording, in essence, the same stuff. Okay, some have details that others don't have and vice versa. And some have situations that they record for a reason that some of the other writers didn't record. But they're still recording the same things. And all of these Gospels, a lot of times we talk about the harmony of the Gospels. Because they harmonize. They go together. And the same is true in terms of some of the, you know, the writings going forward. Uh, James, for instance, or her, you know, James wasn't... Uh, 
uh, an apostle James, but the apostle James was killed by Herod in Acts chapter 12. But you've got, presumably, that's the Lord's brother, okay? Presumably an elder in Jerusalem, but he writes a letter to the saints. You've got Hebrews, which personally I believe was written by John Mark. Uh, but regardless, you've got these letters that are being written, and the Hebrew letter even references the fact that these things were taught to us. These things were, were this is, we are conveying those things that were taught to us by the apostles. And so you've got that, that mixture of both, and they all harmonize together. All right. Uh, Doy says the best situation is when an author was an eyewitness or if he had direct contact with eyewitnesses. Usually, the closer to the events, the better the testimony will be. Now, look at Luke's opening statements again. He had direct contact with eyewitnesses and investigated everything. Matthew was a direct eyewitness, as was John. Mark is said to have written much of what Peter, an eyewitness to Jesus, taught. Of course, you know, John Mark it would seem, tended to be more, especially after his events with Barnabas, after Acts 15, uh, would seem to kind of have helped Peter, just as Silas helped Paul. Uh, John Mark helped Peter, apparently, because later on, Paul says, send John Mark, he's become useful to me because of the efforts of Barnabas and possibly Peter as well. Uh, critics argued that eyewitnesses were not involved in the writing of the Gospels, but remember, the presupposition requires the conclusion. Even if the Gospels were written as late as the 8070s, the oral tradition went back right back to Jesus himself. There were eyewitnesses still around through most of the first century who could testify. Paul wrote within 20 to 25 years of Jesus' resurrection and pointed to people who saw Jesus alive again. 500 brethren, some of whom had died, Paul says. He says, fallen asleep, but many remain. Okay, you can ask them, you can talk to them, and they'll tell you what I'm, what I'm conveying. Uh, much more so than modern critics 2,000 years removed from the events uh, in question. And the point is that these, uh, that these pe were people in a position to know. Peter claimed, we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 1.16, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And I love Doy's point there. Such a claim does not allow us to be neutral about the conclusion. Given the evidence pointing to the authors being in a position to know what they were talking about, the burden of proof falls to those who want to deny it. And I think that's very important. That given the fact that what's being described here, these are individuals who were there or individuals who spoke to those who were there and certainly individuals who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if you're going to say, no, that didn't really happen or no, that's not real, then you're going to have to provide evidence for that, not just say that it didn't happen. If these were any other sources, historians would believe they are generally reliable. There is simply no reason to deny reliability to the biblical writers, unless, of course, our worldview requires a denial of the supernatural. Thoughts or comments through that one? Question four. Did the author's bias distort their historical reporting? So this is another one. In fact, Doy has dealt a little bit with this already in a couple of chapters before, describing the fact, well, you know, they, they really loved Jesus, and so because they loved Jesus so much, they decided they were going to build this entire religion around him, even though he really didn't, uh, wasn't really resurrected, even though he still was in, the, was in the grave. They didn't want to believe it. Okay, that's kind of the thought process that that question's asking. We're told that since the writers have a bias they're trying to prove, then their ability to tell the truth about Jesus is negated. Accordingly, the writers want to invent a Jesus who was divine. So they put words in Jesus' mouth and made up miracle stories. This is assumed, not demonstrated. I think that's a great point. Okay, again, the burden of proof falls on them to prove that. Okay, if we take it at face value, we take it for what it says. They're recording history. You're going to have to prove that these things didn't happen. You're going to have to prove that they made this stuff up and put words in Jesus' mouth. 
We grant that the writers had a motive for telling about Jesus. What was their motive? What does Luke say his motive is to, to Theophilus? That you may have a certainty of those things that you were taught. Okay. Ultimately, what does John say his reason for writing these things? There are many other things that could be, could be written, but these things are written. For what purpose? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. Okay, that, sir, they had a motivation for saying what they said to that end. Uh, they were not academic historians, but were simply followers of Jesus trying to get the message out to a variety of audience. Does that mean they couldn't tell the truth about Jesus? What would be their motivation for doing this? Okay, if, and if they're going to be telling and talking about Jesus, and they're motivated to do so because, you know, they really liked Jesus, they really loved him, and if, as individuals claim, okay, he really wasn't divine, he really didn't arise from the dead, but they just really, they really liked him, and so they just concocted all of this. Would you be willing to watch your family tortured, and then you yourself tortured and killed, protecting it? I mean, wouldn't you recant in the face of that? If it never actually happened, and you just made it up because you, you just loved this man so much, you wanted it to be true. But then when things are happening, you're being put to death, are you going to be willing to, to continue to hold to that and say, no, this really did happen and it's really true when you're absolutely lying about it? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Such assumptions would render all historical accounts virtually worthless because most people would want to write about subjects in which they were personally invested. Josephus, what did he write about? Primarily, destruction of Jerusalem and what happened. And when you read Josephus, you definitely see some of the bias towards the Jews because he was a Jew. You see some of that bias in what he's writing. Does that negate the history he recorded? No, no, it doesn't negate it. You observe that there, he's a Jew and he's recording this on behalf of his people, but that doesn't change the fact that what, at least generally, the scholars agree that he recorded history. Okay. Um, historians today choose topics for which they're passionate, and if we use this criterion to deny reliability of the Gospels, we would, by the same standard, deny the skeptics their ability to adequately speak about their views. Uh, all right, we'll stop there. We will pick up with uh, question five, finish up, because we're almost done actually with chapter 20, move into chapter 21, and then we'll cover the questions. Thank you, everybody.